Well, it's an enormous pleasure to be here, and I love the woods deep inside all this cement. That's great. That's beautiful. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> so, um, I want to talk with you, and I hope that afterwards we have some questions and comments. I want to talk about a kind of reality in the making that I find extremely troublesome. I was just doing an interview for a ZDF program on Google. We all know the issues with Google. But Google, at least, gives us something. We use it. But there are other realities that only take. And I want to talk a bit about that. And I think that this is a very troubled epoch. And partly because we're dealing with a whole series of intermediations. Intermediations are difficult to track. When you say Google, there it is, Google, we know about it, it's a company, it has a headquarters, it actually has many headquarters. Uh, but th there are other realities that, that are not that way. They really are elusive. So in my mind, for instance, one of the things that's happening today, can I interrupt? I hear an echo. Can you hear me well? No problem. So is this better? Maybe? Yeah? So, um, I, one, one of the, the formations that I see emerge is something I refer to as predatory formations. The pre predators, actually, they're often very nice animals and we need them in the biosphere. But, you know, predatory also has that other just purely negative meaning, grabbing, taking, destroying, to take. And these are predatory formations that are constituted by a technical networks, elites, pieces of law, types of accounting. So even if we took all those predatory elites, which is different from predatory formations, and we put them all against the wall and we got rid of them, we would not get rid of some of these dynamics that I want to talk about. So one way of putting it is that while we are very concerned, and I think justifiably so, with the whole question of Google and how, you know, the, the traces that it all leaves. I want to talk about a larger uh, complex of elements that we also need to take into account. And, um, and, and I should say that, that uh, I've come to understand that in my research and theorization practice, I really uh, am into discovering, not replicating, which is what mostly happens in the social sciences, but discovering. And in that effort to discover, to track, to map what isn't quite fully visible and fully mapped, uh, I need sort of this zone of freedom. I'm a social scientist, so, you know, you have to adhere to certain rules. But so I need this little space before, I call it the before method space. And I have already talked about it in other talks, so some of you might have heard this. But it is in a way reminiscent to what Kafka uh, and then also Derrida talk about the space before the law. In Kafka, that space before the law is a space either of terror because you cannot control the law, because the law might come down and chop off your head. Or it is the space of a kind of mental indignation. And this is Kafka in his writing, right? Not terror, but indignation. And for me, it's the zone of epistemic indignation. The way a supposed truth is constructed does violence to me, the neoliberal explanation of what is happening in the world. It does violence to me, but it is a mental violence. So this is a very mental attitude. And so in this zone before method, the kinds of stuff that I do and the kinds of issues that I want to discover uh, uh, sort of require, if you want, what I think of 
as analytic tactics. And I want to dwell on this a bit because I think that in many different domains, uh, these, these are sort of useful instruments. And so when, when you speak, when, when I speak as an academic, as a social scientist, etc., cetera, um, the, the question of elaborating those freedoms when, in fact, a system of what is legitimate knowledge, what is legitimate social science, really produces constraints, doesn't allow you to say anything. Is this getting translated there? Oh, no, not in German, huh? Is everybody understanding my English? I thought you were seeing it in German there, but that's just more English. I like that, twice. The question is, does double English become something else? That's an interesting question. <laughs> so, um, so here are a few of these analytic tactics that can be used by, you know, you can use them in many different fields. So one of them is at a time of instabilities. I think this is such a time. It becomes very important as a researcher, for me at least, to actively destabilize complex meanings that have become stable. For instance, the economy, the middle class, the state, these types of things. Uh, they are never fully stable, but for a while they acquire a certain kind of stability. Today, I think we must destabilize. What does the state mean today? It simply does not mean what it meant 30 years ago. Or, well, Germany has a special history, of course, you know, but in many countries, you know, what it meant 70 years ago, etc. It is a transformed meaning. Uh, the question of inequality, poverty, middle classes, all of these issues, you know, are in unstable. But I think what I'm talking about is the need to actively destabilize, rather than assume that you know it. And very often these meanings are sufficiently complex, like when you say, immigration, the economy. They function as invitations not to think because they come charged with so much content and that is what needs to be destabilized. What is today immigration? It is different from 30 years ago. It raises other issues. When citizens are also losing ground, you know, transversal solidarities should be happening. They're not happening, but they should be happening. They're happening a bit. The second one, powerful explanations. You can't throw a powerful explanation or a powerful category out of the window. But what you can't, because the reason you can't throw them out of the window is that they are made collectively. They come out of long periods of fighting out what what does this mean? What does that mean? They do explain. When we say poverty, when we say immigration, we are also explaining something. We are capturing something. But what you can do is ask, what don't I see when I simply invoke this powerful category, this powerful meaning? And so I find that, again, ex post, not ex ante, that the site of research for me in my 30 years, I'm a grandmother, so I've been at it for a very long time, but in these 30 years, this is the site really where I do my research, where I do my theoretical work, is in the shadows, if you want, in the penumbra around a powerful explanation. So if you think of a powerful explanation as a circle of light on a dark street, in a dark night on the street, the stronger the light in that circle, the more you can see everything inside the circle, but the more difficult it is to see what lies in the penumbra around that circle of light. So that is the tension that I'm interested in, right? I don't want to throw powerful explanations, which are collective productions after all, out of the window, but I do want to understand what don't I see when I am in that circle of light. I need to go crawl and explore, etc., in that penumbra around it. And so my site for research and for theorization has been that around that, you know, that space in darkness and shadows around that circle of light. Now, the, 
Another issue that for me seems extremely important is not simply to talk about inequality, injustice, justice, whatever, but to, to actually ask how is it made? I mean not made as you might make a table, but still made. So I'm interested in the making of inequality. Inequality doesn't just fall from the sky, it is made. Power is made. Justice and injustice are both made. This is a focus that is partial because there are other things. There are inherited genealogies of meaning. There are all kinds of other things. But capturing this making seems particularly important to me in this epoch. Because in this epoch, we sort of are confronted with enormously powerful you know, actors, global finance, the, the executive branch of government. Think of Angela Merkel, how much power her all set up there had. You know, things that we think, my God, it's so much power. It was made, it is made, it can be unmade. So my concern really is, yes, it's partial, but it is about capturing and recovering this making. Now, I think that most of us in our sort of Western style societies, we have become consumers, consumers of everything, of our citizenship, of, you know, of our whatever, the explanations that we accept. And we have to become makers again. So in there also hangs that type of issue for me. Um, and the final point that I'm probably not going to get at is, uh, it, this is about a new little book that I'm writing. As soon as I finish one book, I'm already writing the next one. So, uh, and, and here I want to go back to a complex category, territory, which, uh, which has been taking a very long analytic siesta. It has one meaning today. And when no matter how complex it is, it has only one meaning, it's not working analytically. And that one meaning today is national sovereign territory. So my question is, if I take this complex category, and I should probably explain, I think of territory as a, as a mixture. Yes, sure, ground, land, but it is not. It is not terrain, it is not simply ground, it's not simply land. It has embedded logics of power, which in our modernity, in our Western modernity, became the state. It has embedded logics of claim making, which again in our modernity becomes citizenship. So once you bring that all together, territory is actually an extraordinary mixture of elements. And so I want to free it up so that it can work analytically and, and think of, look at some of these realities that I, that I want to now start uh, describing here and think, what what do I see if I use this category territory? In other words, this complex situation where both power and claim making come together. Now, to frame what I, what I want to talk about a bit more empirically now, I sort of have this little question, one way of framing it, and that is, uh, what's the steam engine of our epoch? Now, I'm giving you a second to come up with an answer. I'm not going to ask you to speak your answer, but I'm hoping that some of you are thinking about this question and that you have sort of a sense. When I ask people, they usually say, information technologies, that is a steam engine. I say no, partly as a provocation, because the information technologies are so pervasive, so powerful, that we sort of feel like, well, of course it is the steam engine of our epoch. So partly as a provocation, but partly because I also believe it. I don't think it is information technologies, because information technologies are extraordinary intermediary things that can be used in many different ways. So there is a bit of the steam engine. When I say the steam engine, I also mean an element that is, sure, the steam engine itself, the train, the steam engine train, etc but it's also indirectly present in just about all other sectors. So it's that kind of powerful presence. So information technologies are a good option. I say, today, it's global finance. Now, quick little statement here. 
Finance is not banking. Finance is not about money. Finance is a capability, and that is why it is powerful and dangerous. It shapes and reshapes our lives, our economies, our states, a whole lot of things. So, so I think of uh, sort of the distinction, if you want, between banking, traditional banking and finance, is that the banking, a bank, sells something, money, it has. Finance sells something it does not have. And in that selling, well, you understood finance, right? And in that selling, what it does not have lies its creativity and its danger. Because it creates bridge after bridge after bridge into everything. It needs to invade other sectors. And that invasion happens in a certain mode through instruments that are elaborated in financial firms, in whatever. And it needs, if you want, grist for its mill. That's a very English expression. I don't know that, I don't know what it means in German, but I hope everybody understands. So it needs stuff. If you have a mill, you need something to make that mill work. And this is, in a way, what finance does. Now, let me give you an image very quickly here of finance as capability. So look at this, I don't have a pointer, but look at this in six years. That's a very short period of time. Uh, this particular instrument, that is just one element, but very innovative, credit default swaps, went from less than a trillion to 62 trillion. I know that in Europe you sometimes use trillion differently. Trillion is a lot of zeros, huh? Uh, that's, and on the, on, the, on the side where it actually counts. Um, now, 62 trillion was more than global GDP of, in other words, the GDP of all the economies in the world in that same year, which was 54 trillion. Uh, and this 62 trillion in that year, 2007, that high point, was only 10% of the global value of finance, which was 630 trillion. That is almost 15 times global GDP. Now, those 630 trillion, it doesn't exist as money. We have a very hard time knowing how much money, actual money, you know, like currency, exists at any given time, including today. We don't know exactly how much, but we know that it is much less than what finance can achieve. So the value of finance in the last year has gone from, has gone, has reached a quadrillion. A quadrillion is even more zeros, three more zeros than trillions, okay? so whoop, like that. That does not exist as cash. So in that sense, capability. Capability in the sense of how rapidly it can grow, and capability because it produces a value that we monetize that actually doesn't exist. When the crisis came, the 208 crisis, you see that little decline already, 45 of these trillion were gone in a period of a month. Poof, like that, as if they had never existed. Not because a pile of actual cash burned, no. Because some tradings went wrong. Let me give you an, an example. This is an instrument that has been used by many firms and also by municipal governments. So a year ago, some of you may have read that, 40 municipalities in Italy, municipal governments, which had all bought a loan, they thought it was a loan, a certain type of loan, the same type of loan, from a European bank whose name shall remain unsaid for a while at least here. And one day, and they were paying, sort of, they thought that they were paying a monthly interest on a loan. One day, about a year ago, they find out that it was a derivative and they all went broke. 
because the whole thing disappeared. Suddenly they were indebted, nothing was left. And those 40 municipalities that, were able, that thought they were able to pay a loan suddenly discovered they didn't have a loan. So that is also an indication of the power. There are many, many such stories and I want to show some. Now what I want to, to show next is one zone which, which again tells us the power of finance and the capacity that finance has had to invade all kinds of sectors. Um, so this is sort of the extreme case, and you see the phrasing here, when modest neighborhoods become part of global finance. And the issue here, if you want, is how does finance so complex the algorithms made by physicists, not even by microeconomists, how does it actually build the bridge into modest neighborhoods? Now, some of you already read all of this. I don't want to, 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 to sort of repeat it. The key point is that uh, in the 2000s, the high-level investors were saying to the financial world, develop some instruments that have real stuff backing them. Now, in the United States at that point, just about everything had been financialized. What was left was modest households that didn't own a house, who inevitably were going to have very modest homes that they would buy. So what was the challenge for finance? To de-link the value of those little houses from the instrument that was going to go and produce lots of profits in the high finance circuit. It took 16 steps, again, the math of physicists, to de-link the modest house and to create, to invent an instrument mixed up with high debt great. I know this is a bit abstract for those of you who are not familiar, but it doesn't matter if you don't totally understand. Uh, this is just a minute of this sort of obscure stuff. And, and in order to produce something that really created a lot of profits, let me just be brief. But here I want to show you the results. So, in a very short, brutal history that begins in 2005 and continues today into 2013 and 2014, uh, over 13 million houses were brought under foreclosure. According to our central bank, 10 million households plus were thrown out of their homes. Because the instrument was not designed to protect them, to give them a house, no. The instrument, they were used. Now this brilliant design has also entered Europe. So if you look, at the numbers are smaller. But if you look at European countries, I have in the book the list of the 27 EU, not quite the 28th, now we are 28, as you know. Anyhow, the highest foreclosures include Germany. Now, all you read about Germany in the Financial Times, which is a very serious newspaper, and what you hear is that Germany is doing fine. It is doing fine, inc incredibly fine, actually. But there's also a layer beneath there that is quite invisible, where there is impoverishment, there is loss of protections, etc., including every, as you see, every year, 90,000, 80,000, 86,000, etc., people thrown out of their homes. Now, and then the, among the lower ones is Bulgaria, Finland, Denmark, Netherlands. No country escapes these kinds of dynamics. And these are processes that continue. And so what interests me also is how invisible they can become. There's a kind of invisibility, no matter the materiality. So if I go back to the prior slide, uh, here, the numbers, just to make the numbers Pythagorean. So take, you know, these 10 million households. A household can be one person, two, three. It's about 30 million people. I'm Dutch. My country has 16 million people. It's as if some voice from up there would say, okay, everybody on the territory of the Netherlands, out. Out of your houses, out of this territory. Where you go, I don't know, but out. And now we're going to repeat it again as an exercise. That is the materiality. And this is quite visible. 
Because the neighborhoods that are empty, all these empty houses, I mean, who goes there? Nobody goes there. The tent cities that have been set up on the outskirts of cities, they're all the same little tents as in the international refugee system. Blue, very neat. Nobody goes there. So there is, there is this issue of how we can produce vast material destructions, and it is not necessarily visible. Now, I want to, to continue with, with something that concerns us all, actually, and that is what, what is the bridge that finance can build into our homes, modest homes included? So here is, a, here is again a short, brutal history. Now look at the title. You just need to, don't look at all the numbers. I'm just going to emphasize a few. So first the title. Ratio of household credit. That sounds great, doesn't it? Credit, money to spend. Well, no, it is debt. It is not money to spend. This is actually debt. So ratio of household debt to personal disposable income. This is IMF data, and they have it for the whole world. Look at Hungary. 2000, it is 11%, very reasonable. By then in the United States, it was already over 100%. So they were 100% in debt, the average household, right? And look Hungary again, five years later, 40%. That is the debt, you understand, that is a huge increase. Four times more, five years later, of debt. And if you look at the United States, it was already 132%. Now, look at Germany, 70, 70, 70, 70. Quite amazing, that kind of stability. It is almost funny. Now, when I see these kinds of figures, I want to know who owns that debt. If a little local bank a traditional bank owns that debt, what you pay in interest, some of it at least, is going to circulate in the town, in the area, whatever. If a big foreign bank owns it, probably they just take it out. The chances that it will recirculate are minimal. And so I went digging into the IMF papers. The IMF actually has a vast amount of data. It's very boring to sort through it, but you know, you can really find interesting, well, I find this interesting. I know that everybody does. So look at Hungary, 40%, this is for 206, 40% of that debt is owned by foreign banks. No, they're not all Americans, it's Swiss, German, and Austrian banks own that debt. Chances are, they are not recirculating those interests that the people pay in the little towns. Taking it out, who knows where it goes. Any franchise does that, by the way. The franchise keeps sure that, you know what I mean by a franchise, right? Like a hotel chain or a Starbucks, whatever, you know, there's many chains. Part of it is taken out. It's taken out of the locality rather than it's circulating. So when you have your own coffee shop out of local stuff, that tends to recirculate much more. Whereas any franchise is going to take part of it out and probably take it in, you know, create some complex financial instruments out of it. So it's very good to, uh, that a locality generates, you know, its own sort of sites for consumption, for production, etc. Now, there is another side to this story which is an invented market, which is just the opposite. These are the super rich. And here there are two stories. That, and this I'm going to run very quickly through this, but this is uh, what you see here, these figures, these numbers, are a minimum price for a house or an apartment. It's a special market. It operates in about 20 cities. And it's sort of part of a serious you know, story. And the, those are the main nationalities. It's mostly foreign buyers who are involved. It's a market that started maybe five or seven years ago. Now here is more, I'm just going to run through this. And more. So, so here is what I want to capture from this. You actually, when you stand back 
and ask yourself, what am I seeing in this super prime market? And this is just housing. This doesn't involve office buildings and all of that. That's also getting bought. But I think that what's happening here is the buying of urban land. How do you buy urban land? You don't buy it as land. You buy it in the form of buildings. And so if you take, for instance, the center of London, the hyper, like the financial center, etc., 70%, and London is a powerful city, I'm not concerned, so concerned about it, huh? but 70% of the buildings are owned by foreign capital. And that is a story that repeats itself. Berlin, in that sense, is quite special, though Berlin is also going in that direction. You know, that, that uh, Berlin has for a, quite a while, certainly when Mitte starts, uh, been sort of generated its own sort of squatting modalities and small ownership, but there is a real push in the world to buy urban land. And so, in many cases, really, it's commercial operations. So you, they buy a set of blocks with little streets, etc., and they make it into one owned complex, right? Something that is owned. That means that they are privatizing all that which was one street space. So when you go to some, some city that is, you know, a global city, etc., cetera, uh, there is a lot of that happening. And that to me also destroys the whole notion of the city, the city as public, you know, the, the public space that is the street, a space marked by indeterminacy. You know, you over-determine that urban space. If you create a shopping mall where once you had urban tissue, lots of little streets, a lot of little houses, a lot of little shops, you simplify that space. And in that sense, I think that one of the, in my sort of reading, one of the challenges today in terms of urban space is this issue of indeterminacy. We are losing indeterminacy. We're over-determining space. Same thing with the super prime housing. They'll buy five little houses and make what we call a Mac mansion, you know what I mean, right? A huge... So, so these are a whole series of dynamics. So if I wanted to find a, you know, what I see in the shadows huh, of this dominant thing about buying houses and buildings, what I see is the buying of urban land. Now, that's a whole new frontier in, on some level, since the buying of land that is not urban is an older story. And here, one, um, one way of shifting now to a different kind of buying of land, and I want to frame it in the sense, again, in the shadows of this dominant category that everybody is speaking about, urbanization. I'm getting very, very irritated when I hear politicians who have never, ever been interested in the city, they're all now saying, most people in the world live in cities, you know? And that's all they say, the city is the city is the city. Here the argument that I'm trying to make is that there is a whole history that is part of this urbanization, but it is in the shadows around that urban condition. So here is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what we call land grabs, right? You know what I'm what that means, right? And, and, and basically, to put it in empirical terms, there are about 15 governments. Yes, it includes China. Yes, it includes the Gulf countries, but it also includes the UK, the United States, Sweden, South Korea. You know, it's a whole bunch of countries, very diverse countries, and about 100 plus firms. Now, I'm talking about a particular period 2006 to 2010, it continues, the period is still on, where over 200 million hectares that we can count, this is a global network called Land Matrix, what has been bought. Now, when China, just to mention one country, huh, because as I said, there are many, but when China buys 2.8 million hectares of land in Zambia and a similar amount in Congo, these are things that happened just a few years ago, to set up a plantation of palm for biofuels. What actually happens? Well, what happens is a massive eviction of floras, faunas, but also rural economies, uh, 
villages that have long genealogies of meaning, that have forms of knowledge that they have had for generations. It is total erasure. But one thing that also happens is, where do those people go? Guess what? They go to cities. That, the city is the last place. Big, anarchic cities are the places where you can actually still, you know, find place to put your body down, so to say. And you have the slums around them, etc. So, back to the shadows. What's in the shadows of urbanization? In the shadows of urbanization, of this urbanization language, is a whole world that is absolutely not urban, like these land grabs. I hope that I'm making myself clear here. So, in the same way that in the shadows of buying buildings and houses in cities lies a deeper process, which is the privatizing of urban land, you know, which is happening in many different modalities. Now here, just to give you some, some figures, Africa, look at the yellow columns. Africa remains the key destination, but you know what? It's happening in other parts of the world as well. And it's happening in Europe. In Europe, uh, it looks so small because the count, as I said, the measure here is at least 200 hectares. Well, you know, in Europe, 200 hectares is a lot of land. So there are many smaller amounts of land that are getting bought by corporate, by firms, uh, that, that are not getting counted. Now, for instance, in France, in France there is a kind of a new generation of men and women who want to do the kind of farming that that was, you know, small farms that are very productive, very well run, they can't find land. France, you know, France has a lot of rural space. They can't find it. Why? Because it's all bought up. This is just a history that is just beginning. And, and uh, in, in, I just spent some time in Cambridgeshire. Isn't that a beautiful... Cambridgeshire, it sounds like an older time. So that is right around Cambridge University. In other words, it's very close to London. You know who's buying land there? I mean, buying it up are the Mormons from Utah, which are a corporation. You know, that's a huge corporation. They are buying land in many different places. Once you begin to dig into this history, it is quite astounding what all is happening. By the way, in Africa, in 2006, right before the crisis explodes, but we know that the financial world knew that a crisis was in the making and was coming. Guess who were the main buyers of land in sub-Saharan Africa in 2006? It lasted for about six months, hedge funds. Not, you know what a hedge fund is, a financial firm. Plus, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, big financial firms, they bought land in Russia, in Ukraine, and uh, clearly they were buying land not because they wanted to become farmers. That was not what they wanted to become. That, they made that a liquid investment. Land stands for industrial crops, say to make biofuels, for food crops, for water, for rare earth, you know the rare earth, right? The, uh, what we use a lot in our electronics uh, gear. So, so this really, this is a deeper story that is happening where chunks of land inside countries are bought by foreign firms and by foreign countries, by foreign governments. So the, I see that is why territory, as I said at the beginning, to me becomes an interesting window, a window onto, onto current histories, the making of new kind of arrangements that is very material, moreover, itself, and it's different from the usual way that we see it with the language of imperialism, the language of you know, whatever. So I, I just am hoping, again, to see something. Now, just a final point on this. This is what most of the land that is measured. I mean, there are more acquisitions that we may not necessarily have the data for. And as you see, the main use of that land that is bought 
is for biofuels. Now that has consequences. So it's not for food. People often think it's for food. No, it's not. Now there are two issues here that, that, that are consequential. One of them is that when you, when you are planting a lot of biofuel crops like palm and soy, you're actually bringing about hunger among the workers because the workers are not planting what they can eat and they might just generate their own little farming, etc. setups. They're planting something that they cannot eat. So in parts of Argentina and Brazil, where you have long had hunger, I mean poverty, but not hunger in rural areas, you now have hunger. And these are also, these are these micro histories that come with some of these transformations. Secondly, when you're, when you're growing biofuel, I mean industrial crops, you can put pesticides and fertilizers to a much larger extent than you can with food crops, which have a bit of certification and controls. So that means that the level of poisoning and toxicity of the land and the water and what is grown is very, very high, which means that all around the smaller farm areas that may stay in the area, their, their land and their water sources are also contaminated. So that is another way in which these people, even if they are farmers and they still have their little land, it is poisoned. And so they also eventually leave for the cities. So no matter how you look at it, this is a very problematic story. Now, ah, uh, let me check my clock because I don't have a good sense of my time. Okay, so, so I want to very quickly run, but not describe, because I want to begin to wrap up. Um, a set of curves. I like to do these graphs where you have a lot of, lot of numbers, but you make them into a line rather than a matrix. And so a line that actually tells a tale, a line that tells a story. And uh, so here are some of them. Now here what I would love you to point, to notice that, well, this is about corporate profits. The focus here, the data come from the United States, but the trends are quite similar in, say, in Germany and in other rich countries. Now, so you have this, you know, because it's in billions, here what, it, what the straight line means, not that they were doing nothing, but that it was below billions, you know, the billion, the zeros have really been multiplying. And see, it begins to go up in the 70s, in the, in the 90s when the global economy globalizes, it's not just a limited number, but it's very large, and then it goes up very sharply, sharp fall, that's the crisis, which lasted about half an hour, I exaggerate, huh? it's more like two years, and then it goes even higher. The profits right now are higher than they were before the crisis. Now, that is partly because our governments have passed on massive amounts of real cash, not derivatives, eh? money, our money. The United States government put at the disposal of the global top banks, including German banks, seven trillion dollars of citizens' money. That's a lot. And we now know from Freedom of Information Act that 21,000 plus requests came in from German banks, Austrian banks, Swiss banks, French banks, etc., 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 plus all kinds of American firms. Yes, I will take your cheap cash. In the meantime, of course, we are cutting programs to feed the poor, etc., etc. I don't need to develop that, but it's really bad. Now, here's another one. This is corporate assets. Look, here you don't even have a dip when the crisis comes. It's like they happily keep on growing, even as 10 million households are thrown out of their houses, long-term unemployment increases, little firms go broke, owners of little firms commit suicide because they can't manage it anymore. And here, corporate assets just grow happily. These are extraordinary dysfunctions. So in the shadows, of this language of crises, 
that we, the citizens of these countries, have paid, we have delivered the goods to our government who then delivered the goods to, are these kinds of curves. You know, growth, growth, growth. Now here is one of states. This is the opposite. This I decided not to put in a graph. But look, even Germany, these are the increased debt that our governments have. Now look, even Germany goes in the 1980s from 13% to 44%. Three, threefold increase. Uh, the United States goes from 25 to 61. Again, a threefold increase, starting from a higher. So those are increases that say, we the citizens are indebted. Our debt is growing. It's a debt managed, handled by our states. But it is our debt. We have to recognize that's our state and we should reoccupy it and make it work differently, right? That is not the state, that's our state. We are partly that state. Now, here is another graph which to me tells the tale in extreme version for the United States, but in milder versions everywhere. And this is a hundred years, more or less, almost. In fact, it goes on till 2010, it's cut off here. So it is almost really a hundred years. Now what this shows you is the capture in terms of income. And this is not wealth, this is income from jobs of the top 10% earners. It was up to 47% in the high point in the early 90s, which then ends with a big crash on Wall Street, right? Then it goes whoop down, stays more stable. That is the period, I wish I had a pointer, though that lower line of the Keynesian years, that, that indirectly tells you the loss of capture at the top is the gain of a middle class. 1987, whoop, it goes up. And in fact, if you look at it, it goes up further, further, you know, if you extend it. So this to me captures the particularity of that period when we had the expansion of a middle class. The state of nature for capitalism, for a capitalism that has big corporates, whether it's finance or industrial, it's really those two other periods. That is the exception. And it lasted for about 40 years. You know, it varies a bit in different countries. And here you have another version. Now again, this is the United States. This is growth in after-tax income from 1979 to 2007. By now we have the 2010 census and the, the strange is that just goes up. The top 1% has almost 300% increase in those 30 years. And again, this is income, this is not wealth. Wealth grew even more sharply. Half, almost half of the people had almost no growth. But the visual order of these 30 years was the visual order of the global city. Fantastic new luxury restaurants, luxury office buildings, luxury blah, blah. So the, when, when I was doing my research in the 80s on the global city, I was saying, we're headed. I have a whole chapter on that. We're headed towards growing inequality. People said, no, look at this. New York used to be poor and now it is reinvented. And you could say that for all kinds of cities, for London, for Tokyo, for Paris, for Frankfurt, you know, in the, how they sort of rebuilt a luxury city. And, and so the visual order talked a language of everything is good, getting better. These big cities were quite, had become quite poor, you know, in the 50s and in the 60s, because they were not these massive centers of power and sort of corporate power. So this to me again tells quite a tale. Now here's another kind of growth. Wealth, so this is from 1962 to 2010. For the longest time, sure, the top 1% of wealth, they were always getting a good share. Look in the 2000s, it shoots up. You know, and that is the time of the crisis as well. That is when for a lot of people, it went down, they lost. And here is another one, share of total wealth gain from 83 to 2010. The bottom, you know, up to the fourth, up to the fourth thing, so that is quite a share of the population has lost two-thirds of the households, have lost wealth. 
and because then it breaks down, you know, the top 1%, top 95%, it's all there. Now, if you do that for Germany, you are not going to find such an extreme, but you're going to find the pattern. This pattern is everywhere. This is telling us that whatever the intermediate structures that prevented this extreme capture at the top, they are weak. And we have capture at the top. So, and here is another one totally different. This is internally displaced people. I have a whole series of juxtapositions of increased imprisonment. In the United States, the population that has been increased has increased by 800% from 1980 to today. That is an extreme version of a trend that is also happening in the UK, in Australia, you know, it's, I don't know about Germany there. This is displaced, you know. So these are negatives that are all growing. It's just an extraordinary set of landscapes. Now I want to conclude with something about unstable meanings and focusing on the notion of membership and really who are we today, the citizens? Who are we? And I don't mean citizens in the narrow sense. I mean those who reside in a country, in a territory. So it could be immigrants, it could be not tourists, let's say, but you know, people who live there. And so I want to show you a map, and I want to make two comments. So this is a map of 10,000 buildings that are full-time data gathering about all our acts of communication. So they're very busy. 24 hours non-stop, one million top secret clearance. Mr. Snowden comes out of that. One million, to have one million top secret clearance is huge. Secondly, it's actually quite international, you know, the, the setup of the data, the top levels. Because if your best algorithm builder is a Russian mathematician, you're hired there. Most of these are private firms. This, this operation is done mostly by private firms on behalf of our government. Eh? So this is a government operation, but subcontracted. So the zone of gathering data about all of us, all our acts of communication, is very, very international. And I always say, that's the most sympathetic part of it. You know, that is really sympathique. But of course, what they're doing is not so great. Now, I want to mention two things. This map is from 2010, before Mr. Snowden. This map is in the public domain. The Washington Post, a well-established newspaper, did it. Had 16 top people working at it. It was a lot of work. Created an interactive setup. I really recommend people going to see it. This is just one map of that. When I would talk to people, about this before Mr. Snowden, I don't mean to experts, you know, but to sort of more general audiences, they simply could not relate to this. Yes, they saw it, they understood the words, but the reality was too much to understand. I thought that was very interesting, and I'll tell you why I thought that was interesting. When Mr. Snowden's story becomes a global story, people began to understand something that was happening in their country. And when I would then, post Snowden, present this data and more data like this, they could relate to it. They had questions, they wanted to know. So this sort of, this comes back to where I started, you know, what is it that we see? Again, the center of light and not what is in the shadows, all of that stuff. And I think that and for me as a researcher on these issues, this becomes critical. You know, why is it that certain material realities become invisible if we don't have the intermediation of a, some sort of a story, a rhetoricizing, you know, something? Like the story of Google, how Google right now becomes an object of multiple criticisms because we have understood that this is data gathering, that data is a source of profit, that data can be used in many different ways. You know, we need these intermediations in order to understand our reality. Or what I was saying about all those people who have been thrown out of their homes, invisible. Not that they are not visible when they're standing in, you can see them with this eye, but you cannot see them with that conceptual eye that 
has a narrative attached to it. I find that really interesting. Now, the second issue I want to point out is given this setup, and by the way, it's also in Germany. You know that you also, this is enabled by the way, in the UK, in Germany, in the United States, this notion of data gathering about the citizens that falls a bit outside standard law is enabled because all of us, all of our governments are existing right now under a state of exception. It's partial, but it's there. So for instance, people, I, I first understood that about Germany when some people were thrown in jail, the Attorney General, by orders of the Attorney General of Germany, captured them, put them in jail, didn't inform anybody. In other words, absolute violation of standard law, habeas corpus, etc. In the United States, this is happening quite a bit with suspects of terrorism, etc., mostly Muslim men. And, um, and this is what the state, state of exception enables, which is that, the, after all, the state of exception, in other words, the security, right, a security state, is, is uh, the justification is, oh my God, I have to end now. All right, uh, the justification is that the, the country, and that means all of us, are under threat. You know, in our particular period, it is the threat of terrorism. And uh, so, so this also comes out of that. And so the, the question that I have is, you know, under these conditions, who are we, the citizens? What does it really mean? And here this issue that I was saying at the beginning that the, the executive branch of government has been a real partner for the making of this global corporate and financial world that is really demolishing big hunks of our average citizen's reality. Huh? Who are we? And you almost feel, and again, when I say citizen, I mean full-time residents of a country. I, I don't mean as they could be immigrants too. Huh? It's the generous meaning of citizen. Who are we the citizens? Are we the new colonials? You know, who are we? And what I want to bring out of that is this sort of a call for transversalities. Not that we all love each other, no. But that our destiny is going to have to be more marked by these transversal solidarities and understandings, not love and agreement, but solidarities. Growing in Latin America, up in Latin America, solidarity is the term, not empathy. You don't need to have empathy with somebody, agree with how they're feeling, or agree why they're suffering, no. Or share their suffering. I find that always a bit problematic. Solidarity is foundational, strong, and has a, a sort of a, an indifference to the emotional side of it, right? But that is what we're going to need. So that we're going to have to make a new type of citizenship where it coalesces. When you think all of our states in these Western leading states, they all have this state of exception that I repeat enables the state to violate its own foundational law. Some action needs to be taken and I think the actions that are happening that are being taken are all focused on very specialized domains, which I think is good. That is the only way to do it, probably. But there's also this more, if you want, general set of issues. So now I'm going to shut up, and maybe we have a bit of time for questions. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>